Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Cooperative this wonderful, wonderful Thursday morning. And this morning, we're going to talk about food co-ops again. And we have Mr. Stuart Reed with us this morning. Stuart, good morning. Good morning, Vernon. How are you today, sir? I'm doing well. Looking forward to this conversation. Me too, because you started in 1972 as bagging food. <laughs> yeah, I uh, actually I started my food career before that. I, my first uh, full regular paycheck job was as a carryout boy in a high V grocery store. And I'll tell you what, if you had told me then that I'd be doing food the rest of my life, I don't think I would have believed you. So were you in high school with your first delivery? Yeah, we. I was stocking shelves and bagging groceries uh, back in high school days. Fantastic. And somehow you've uh, enjoyed handling food your whole life, I take it. I have. It's uh, It was not the path I thought I was on, but uh, like a lot of us, I think, that are involved in co-ops, we, we found our way there later. And uh, once we found it, we, we were stuck. Well, I knew nothing about co-ops. I didn't do bagging food, and I never would have thought I would be a radio host. I fell into this, and I love <laughs> yep. it. Okay, so sometimes the path isn't the one we would take. But so, talk it to me. Anyway. How did you how did you get into co op? So the first job was not in a co op; it's just a regular grocery store. Is that correct? That's right. Um, I got into co ops when uh, I was in college, and uh, we had a very small neighborhood corner store that had become a food co op. Uh, it was near where I lived, and we were my uh, then wife and I were shopping there, and to save money because we were college students. So uh, back in those days, you could volunteer some time at the co-op and get a discount on your groceries. So that's really how I got started. So you say you and who were shopping there? My my first wife. Okay, so okay, so you and your wife in college, you're shopping there. Money's tight if it was like it was for me in college. So you figure yep. out where you could get food <laughs> cheaply. <laughs> well, and, and natural organic options weren't as big of a thing then, but for vegetarians, and my wife was vegetarian, uh, the, the options at the co-op were a lot better than what were available in other places. So uh, it, was, it was natural food oriented, but it was before we really had all of the options that are out there now for organic products. Okay, shopping for food in college, organic, and food co-ops have been the ones that I understand. You can tell me if this is correct or not, but they're the ones that sort of started labeling foods and uh, really going after organic foods because that's what the folks wanted that were going to food co-ops. Yeah, that's largely true. Uh, we weren't the only ones, but there were very few outlets for natural food, and uh, in order to make it available to people at a reasonable price, the co-ops, I think, led the way in reducing packaging, selling things in bulk, uh, having products that people could buy in whatever quantity they needed, and, and of course, the education and outreach component of co-ops, helping people understand how to use these foods, that a lot of them were new to them and new to the market even. All right, so let's talk. go through your life history here in some kind of order. <laughs> so you were bagging food, and you start shopping for, in a food co-op that was a corner store yeah, that well, became a co-op. Right. A um, couple of the co-ops in the Minneapolis area where I was uh, for most of my adult life had been other stores. Uh, they may have closed or were about to close, and uh, co-ops took advantage of 
at that time, the low cost of the space, that there was already equipment there. Um, I know of my first co-op that I worked at as a paid employee was the Seward Co-op in Minneapolis. And What's the name of that? They again? got the Seward, S-E-W-A-R-D. Okay. Um, and it's now one of the larger co-ops in, in the country, uh, certainly one of the largest in the Twin Cities market. But at that time, it was a small corner store where they wanted to sell the equipment. And some people from another co-op that was already open went to look at the equipment and said, hey, why don't we uh, see if we can just take over the whole building? Uh, I think they made the down payment on somebody's credit card, if I remember my history right. Okay. (laughs) And uh, that was the start of another co-op. And so you, your first job in that food co-op, steward co-op in Minneapolis was what? What did you do there? Well, at that time, we were uh, most of the co-ops were managing by collective. We had a group of, uh, of staff that shared a lot of the responsibilities and decision-making and management all pretty evenly. So I was, I was one of that group, and um, I started learning different aspects of the grocery business uh, hands-on, as you if you will, mm-hmm. and um, went on to get some more formal training from some of the uh, programs that were available at that time for, for uh, food co-op managers. And it just one thing led to another, and I, and I just got deeper into it and enjoyed it and stayed with it. So did you finish your college degree, degree and if so, in what? Uh, yes, I did. I, I have a degree in German. <laughs> German? Oh, that's, that yeah. comes in handy in running a food co-op, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, very much so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. As they told us when we were at the university in the German department, it's a great preparation for a job in uh, insurance sales or, you know, uh, something like that. So I think grocery was a better choice than insurance sales. Yeah, I don't even see the connection there, but okay. <laughs> no, it was it was kind of a joke. There oh, are okay. a lot of jobs out there for German majors. No. Oh, so you're managing collectively in Stewart Co-op in Minneapolis, and what year is this? About what year is this? Oh, let's see. I think I first started there in uh, 1976, if I remember right. Okay. Uh, as an employee, and. Uh, I was there for a, a summer job that they had offered. Uh, was gone for a little while doing something else, and came back less than, about a year later, and stayed on for another five years. At that time, uh, after that, I did some other work in co-ops. For, I worked as a buyer for one of the warehouses that the co-ops owned in Minneapolis at that time, and uh, managed came back and managed the Seward Co-op again later, uh, did a startup co-op in, in Northfield, Minnesota called Just Food Co-op that is there now and doing well, and uh, then moved on to what I'm doing today. Okay, so let's back up a little bit on this warehouse. So the the a group of food co-ops owned a warehouse, so they came collectively and bought a warehouse? More or less, yes. Uh, at that time, in the in the late seventies and early eighties, there were uh, as several, I think, as many as a dozen co-op owned warehouses around the country serving regional markets. And in Minneapolis, it was called the Distributing Alliance of the North Country Co-ops, or Dance, which was a lot easier to say. And uh, it was uh, it was a significant operation. Uh, served a lot of co-ops. Uh, and it was owned by the co-ops themselves. Over time, almost all of, well, I guess actually all of the co-ops warehouses now have um, were sold to other distributors or closed. Uh, the grocery business being one of scale, uh, it's really became difficult for them to con- remain competitive uh, against the really big players out there. And unfortunately, we no longer have that that infrastructure that helps support the co-ops. I thought there would be more of a need of that as you got the big box stores in. You got more of a need of buying volume so that they could get a lower price. Yeah, it is true that, um, and what we've, 
co-ops have done instead is through the National Co-op Grocers Organization, they have a, a group contract now. Uh, so all of the member stores of that organization are combining their buying power to get a, a group contract with one of the larger natural food distributors. Uh, that that does give them a very good program. Uh, some of the co-ops are not members of the organization, are, are out there but having to buy on their own, make their own deals. So it doesn't help everyone, but it does help a large percentage of the, of the co-ops in the country. Okay, so they found a way of buying in volume and getting better pricing without having to warehouse it themselves. Yeah, yeah, basically. And there are some smaller regional distribution centers now that are co-op owned. Uh, one of them in Minneapolis is called Co-op Partners Warehouse, which originally was a produce buying operation that the Wedge Co-op started. And in order to, just for themselves as much as anything, to be able to get uh, the products they wanted in better condition, better prices, but they started redistributing to the local co-ops and now redistribute regionally and have included other products from local farmers and producers and, and some staple products as well. So they're not, they don't have the scale of the, the really big natural food warehouses, but they have a, a more specialized focus that really does a good job for the co-ops in their region. So that falls under the sixth principle of cooperation among co-ops. They form, work together through the three national grocers, uh, national co-op grocers or a regional right. warehouse come together so that each can support each other. Yeah, I think the food co-ops have always done a pretty good job of turning to each other for support and sharing the resources they have. There have been numerous programs over the years where, uh, as co-ops have learned, they have shared what they've learned. And we've, as a result, we've got some very strong systems in the food co-op sector for financial information, uh, for sharing best practices of management, uh, board training, a lot of different systems uh, that we evol have evolved as a community effort and are pretty openly shared among that community. So what do you do now after you, you've done all of that? You said you, the job that you have now. <laughs> well, now I've got the fun job of helping communities start new food co-ops. And uh, Food Co-op Initiative was created uh, uh, about 12 years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. Originally, it was a pilot project called Food Co-op 500. It was not formally incorporated, but it was an effort by some of the larger organizations out there, including National Co-op Bank, your own sponsor. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been a major sponsor and supporter of ours all the way through. Uh, National Co-op Grocers and some of the consultants that did co-op work, they sat down together and said, we've got a lot of people asking us for help all of a sudden. Uh, how are we going to do that in a way that helps co-ops get open a little quicker without making all the same mistakes? And they put together this uh, this pilot project, and uh, the, originally there was a, a little bit of money for some seed grants to help. Hey, the, Stuart, the that's a, let's, let's talk about this after our first break. We'll come back okay, and talk sure. about what you've been doing to help communities start food co-ops. And we're going to take great. a first break to get the weather, the traffic, and the news, and we'll be right back. Please don't touch that dial. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOS, 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Everything Co-op is the program. And right now, we want to give a shout-out to Keith Wicks, who was on last week. He's a founder and president of Keith, Keith Wicks and Associates. He goes around and he helps co-ops. He's a consultant. And he told us a about our guest today on the show. He told us about Stuart Reed yeah. and the uh, Food Co-op Initiative as somebody that 
has a lot of skills in helping co-ops. And so he gave us your intro. Do it. Appreciate that. He happens to live not too far from me, and we get together every once in a while, and we get to talk co-op, uh, and it's a lot of fun. Well, I like talking to anybody who wants to talk about co-op, okay? So talking co-op is great. Me too. <laughs> talking <laughs> co-op is great. So Pat Thornton reached out to you, our producer, and we have you on today. And so thank you so very much for taking out your time. And I want to thank Keith for telling us about you. I'm happy to be here. When we took the break, uh, you started talking about the Co-op 500, I think is what you called it. Yeah. Food Co-op 500 was our first origin. And as I was saying, we the goal was to see if there was a way to help communities get co-ops open quicker, more efficiently, with more success. And we started out by doing some small grants to give them some development capital at the early stages. And they recruited a lot of people that had experience working in co-ops, some consultants, some general managers, people like myself, who at that time had recently helped open a co-op. And we would, once a month, have a conversation on the phone with people starting co-ops and try to offer advice. Well, and that was working well, uh, and that's how I got introduced to the program as a volunteer. Uh, after about a year, they decided they wanted to have somebody uh, paid to, to coordinate everything, and uh, I liked the program. I liked the opportunities, so I applied, and, and I've been doing it ever since. What year is that? Uh, that was... Uh, I'm so bad with dates. I think it was 2016, or I mean uh, 2006. 2006, so you've been at it for about 12 years full time. Right. Now, the yep. Co-op 500 was to help 500 co-ops get started, maybe? Well, that's, yeah, that number isn't Fo- coincidental, although it, it isn't, ag- uh, the story was, uh, it came from Marilyn Scholl, who was a food co-op consultant and educator who just recently was inducted into the Co-op Hall of Fame. She had gotten an award at one of the co-op conferences and in her acceptance challenged the audience to see 500 co-ops in the United States in the next, uh, I think it was 10 years. Uh, at the time, there was probably maybe around 300, although the exact numbers had been hard to nail down. And that became sort of an unofficial goal, although we did not reach 500 co-ops. Um, it turned out that it takes longer to open new stores. And, uh, well, it was, well, it was a, a nice thing to put out there as a target. It was never actually a hard goal of the organization. It was sort of just a challenge to ourselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we changed the name to Food Co-op Initiative in uh, 2010 when we incorporated for the first time as a nonprofit. Um, And that made it possible for us to um, be eligible for some grant funding. Uh, We're supported by USDA's Rural Co-op Development Program, for example. The National Co-op Bank is a big sponsor of the National Co-op Grocers. And with that, Grant funding, we were able to expand the organization from just one paid person to two and eventually three. And that's where we are now. We have a staff of three, and uh, we're supporting as many as 140 communities around the United States at any one time. Wow. Three people supporting 140 communities? Yeah, that it's it's a challenge, as you can imagine. And we, we've always emphasized materials that people can use on their own. We have a very deep website with a lot of resources, uh, guides on how to start a co-op, guides on uh, recruiting owners, raising capital, finding sites, a little bit of everything. And we do training conferences and, and other events. But we've structured it so that we can provide a lot of information to a lot of people and then when we can, we spend as much time personally answering questions and giving uh, specific advice to groups that may not be covered. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's we would love to be a bigger organization. We could certainly do more work uh, than what we are now. There's a, there's a demand for it. There's a huge interest. Um, but there are limits. 
So it's you, Stuart. I'm on your web page. Jacqueline Hanna, yeah. Assistant Director, and Murray Steins Wilborn, Outreach and Operations Coordinator. But you got a That's nice right. looking board. We do. We've got a great board. There are people with a lot of depth of experience in co ops, uh, from uh, the consulting community to banking to the Blooming Prairie Foundation, which incidentally is a major sponsor that really was, uh, kept us from folding at one point by, by committing a large amount of money to our future. Um, got to have a shout out to them. They're great people. Now, who was that again? Um, yeah, the Blooming Prairie Foundation. And it's, that's an interesting story in itself. The Blooming Prairie Foundation was formed with some of the money that uh, was left when the food co-op warehouse was sold. Uh, it was the Blooming Prairie Warehouse, it was called, and when it was sold, um, I don't know, maybe it was 10 or 12 years ago, or maybe more, uh, they were they did it before it was going under, and they actually made some profit on the sale, which was distributed to the owners, the co-ops, and part of it was set aside for future cooperative development, very foresightedly, and that became the Blooming Prairie Foundation. It's amazing how, yeah, sort of co-ops to to the extent that we do it, co-ops do this, it help to reinvent and put up monies to help to start other co-ops. It is it is a challenge, and uh, we don't have a system in the United States that other countries have that automatically provides uh, the money needed to to do cooperative development. It, it uh, we're reliant on goodwill to a certain extent, uh, generous and forward-looking organizations like the ones I've mentioned that support us and other organizations. And and the co-ops will also contribute to our work. Uh, it's not a lot, but it, it's certainly meaningful, and it helps. We, we appreciate everything we see. But, uh, yeah, it's a challenge raising money to do this work at the same time you're trying to spend your time doing the work. Um, it's like every nonprofit. You've got to balance your, balance your time. And you're trying to offer support to communities that more often than not don't have the funds to start a co-op, so they can't pay you the big consultant bucks. Okay, so right. you're, you're yeah. helping. Well, we're structured. We're structured so that all of our services are free. Now, that was an intentional choice. And we wait, wait, hold on a minute. To, hold on. Hold. Yeah. All your services are free. Yes. Uh, the only thing we charge for is is uh, uh, registration for our annual conference that we do, and we keep that very low so that as many people as possible can attend. And that, we don't make any money on that one. It just pays for the bills. So the annual conference is when? It's in uh, – typically it's in uh, um, May. I ruled it. Okay. So, from, uh, you, bought, you know, you should never ask me dates when I'm live. I, it's like they say that, never that, do math that, on the air. I can't do dates on the air. Oh no, I'm cool um, with what you've said. It's April, May. That's I was just getting a sense yeah, of is it, is it is it is it coming yeah, up or it, is it already done for this year? So I got it finished. It's done for this, this year. year. It's done this year. It's called the Up and Coming Conference, and uh, we get about 300 uh, co-op organizers from around the country uh, for two and a half days of intensive training, networking, and fun. It's a lot. Of, it, it, we, we make sure it's a fun event, and it's really popular. People learn a lot and go home inspired. So that's that's one of our big deals, and we do that in collaboration with the Indiana Cooperative Development Center. Um, Deb Troca manages that organization, and she, she originally had the idea for doing this event, and uh, we participated because it was for food co-ops, and uh, have become a full partner in in the last couple of years. Well, Deb has been on the program, uh, and also you mentioned Marilyn Scholes. <laughs> She's been on the program, too. Uh, uh -huh. And so it's nice to have met some of these people in the inner corporate. And there is a group that's starting a co-op in D.C. in Ward 8, which is a right. food desert, and they came to the, some of them came to this, conference. I knew that 
I didn't know you were involved in your organization, but I did know the Indiana uh, Corporate Development Association was involved. Um, and they went out a couple years ago. I don't know if anybody went this past year or not. Uh, I don't remember seeing anybody this last year, but yeah, no, we, we they have been. Washington has been an interesting, D.C. area has been interesting to work with. One of our very first co-ops that we worked with was an H, the H Street Co-op what? in Washington, and they folded. They didn't. Uh, they got to a point where they felt they just didn't, weren't going to be able to find a site. They weren't being, getting enough support in building membership. So I was glad to see that there's new efforts, um, but it's it's not easy. Um, and urban areas in particular, I think, are challenged with trying to build the community support around the co-op. Um, well, we, we're, we're going to take our second, Stuart, we're going to take our second break, and I'd like to come okay. back and talk about the challenges in D.C. We'll, we'll be right back, everybody. We're with Stuart Reed on Food Cooperative Initiative. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOS, and 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Everything Cooperative is the program. We get to talk co-op today, and I'm talking co-op with Mr. Stuart Reed, who's been in this business a lot longer than I have. <laughs> and starting from... Bagging groceries to helping to start food co-ops around the nation. I want to go back really quick to up-and-coming conference before we talk about D.C. and perhaps some of the startup stories. Um, sure. The conference um, I want to go to next year, so I just want to put that out there. We, well, well uh, we would love to have you. National Co-op Bank uh, has been a great, great sponsor. Um, and for five years, we've October will be five years. We um, we started this, Stuart, to do it for one month to celebrate Co-op Month in October five years ago. And it, it's uh-huh. been going strong ever since. And we're getting ready to pump up. We uh, took to the bank, to Chuck Snyder and group, a proposal to buy some equipment so I could do the program live in Indiana, Minnesota, Wisconsin, anywhere. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so we're in the process of buying that equipment. And so I'm wanting to take to conferences like yours and interview people at the conference, perhaps some of these 300 startup folks, we could get them to come by and talk about their communities and why they need a food co-op and what they're doing and what stage they're in. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting out and, and talking to people. I'm looking forward to, as I travel now, wherever I was up in Ithaca, New York, uh, at a health retreat and I found a food co-op there and went in and talked to them. And then eventually they were on the program. I found an artist co-op, um, Artists got together, different artists, whether they're making jewelry or wood carvings or whatever, and they they had a storefront where they could sell their goods. And they had some very nice uh, art in there, and not inexpensive. <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> my, yeah, but it was very nice talking I, to the folks. So I'm wanting to to go. Well, and we store. would love to have you, um, and I'm sure that the, uh, you would find that the stories of the startup organizers that are attending are, are very inspiring. They're very passionate people, uh, and uh, it would it would be good good for you. I think good radio. Yeah, because we I like the idea. Oh, I know I know what it was. Oh, the reason I wanted to go back to it because you mentioned my favorite word. At least one of them is fun. Okay, I like having fun. So if yeah. we can have fun and talk business and help communities and inspire folks, that's sort of like that would be great. Okay, absolutely. Well, we we believe strongly that this is a you know it takes three to five years, sometimes as long as ten, believe it or not, for these groups to get from the first idea to an open storefront. It's amazing that anybody can keep that going that long using mostly volunteers and 
almost always people that really haven't had any experience starting a grocery store before. Uh, pretty amazing that they can pull it off at all. And Isn't it amazing? I mean, it's almost miracle, miraculous. It's almost in that whole spiritual world of you've got everyday people. And I found I, I manage housing co-ops, so that's how I... But everyday people, yeah. sometimes at best of high school education, no business experience except for running a household, um, and they get in and make it work if they use the principles yeah. and the values and, you know, really learn how to be accountable and the principles, responsible. It works. That's right. Yeah. It, it's one of the things that makes this such rewarding work is to see how people can step up and, and really – empower themselves in their own communities. Well, do you, do you like what you do? Oh, absolutely. I, I wouldn't do anything else. Uh, I don't think I ever will. Um, you know, this is, this is great. I get to, not only do I love food and, and co-ops, but the idea that I can help communities get off the ground and, and spread the co-op movement, start new stores that are serving more people. That's very rewarding. And I love the people I work with. Uh, the cops out there, you know, like I said, it's very inspiring to hear their stories, to work with these people. And I enjoy the heck out of it when I get a chance to visit face to face. Okay. So I knew the answer. There's nobody been on the program that said, no, I don't like what I do. I have a hard time getting up <laughs> in the morning. A guy that named Cornelius. For you, huh? I like Cornelius yeah. Blanding uh, out of, um, Federation of Southern Co-ops uh, started in the 60s during the Civil Rights Movement. He, he said that his his problem is br- having to break away from work to go home and play with his kids. I mean, he, that's the yeah. problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's talk about D.C. a minute. You said that there was an H3 co-op that did not get off the ground. Um, right. They were starting it. And this, this group is starting it. They uh, they're starting in Ward 8, which is across the Anacostia. It's been normally the uh, lower-income communities, uh, mostly African-Americans. It's changing with gentrification, but uh, that's yeah. been Ward 8, and it's been a food desert. And um, I'll just to give you a little background, um, there's a, a, a group that is... Oh, I can't. Sometimes the brain doesn't work. I'll get the name here in a minute, but a council member is putting forth a proposal to start two grocery stores, and he's planning on starting funding to get money to start um, to build stores that they could put a giant or uh, some other big box store in there, Safeway, something. And so I did go to the um, hearings on it, and I testified and asked them, why don't you take the same money and put in four uh, food co-ops and build Mm -hmm. them? And then that way they would take a lot of the money away from, particularly if they could build them and give them low-cost rent, um, in two in Ward 7 and two in Ward 8. Um, Uh Well, that would be great. Um, you know, obviously the capital needed to start a grocery store is, is, is high. It, it, uh, it's gone up a lot even in the last few years. And if you can reduce that startup cost, that's, that's one of the barriers. Uh, you, the other side of that is that you still need the strong commitment from the community to support the store. And, you know, we want to see a lot of people signing up as owners as or members, as we used to call them more often, uh, in the, in putting a little investment in. It's not much for each individual, but a lot of people together investing a little money means that you've got a broad ownership base that cares about the business and has a say in how it operates. And that's the core of being a co-op. So sometimes we've found that the, or it's harder to get the message out and to build that engagement in lower income communities in urban markets, particularly where it's a lot familiar concept and getting the right people to spread the message, people that are trusted in the community, people that uh, 
whose voices are respected and heard is really important to these projects. They've, they've got to have strong community backing. And uh, so, yeah, uh, if you can combine that with anything that helps offset the high cost, you're well ahead of the game. Well, I got the name Vincent Gray, and I apologize to him for not having his name. He has been a city council in Ward 7 where I live and work, and he was a mayor, and now he's city council again. But uh, just take it off. To, I had a senior moment there. Okay. Uh, That's right. Okay. <laughs> and I it's, really like – It's interesting. Huh? Go ahead. No, I was just saying it's interesting that there are several cities now around the country where the – civic government has you right and so it was a great conversation and i brought in and one up one doctor uh talked about co-ops and um so it wasn't that much conversation but that's why i'm trying to get that kind of conversation on the floor and one of his staff members i had on the on the program to talk about co-ops so i'm trying to feed them information about co-ops so that they can get smart about them so we might get something like what they've done in madison wisconsin and new york yeah uh, right. uh, I think New York was a $2.6 million, $2.5 million one year, two point six to start work. She called him and his group angels. Yes. Yes. Uh, good description. Because their, their mission, National Co-op Bank's mission, is to just help the co-ops, and particularly in low-income communities, which is... I took banking. I thought I wanted to be a banker because bankers seemed like they they captured money. It seemed like money stuck to them, or they knew they knew how to manage it. Um, I found out that that was not. I didn't go into that world, um, but in my study for banking, the banks are only in their money or already have wealth, they have assets, and folks in the neighborhoods um, normally don't have money, whether it's rural neighborhoods and. Farming communities or in urban, they, that's what they do. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, you know, that's that's a challenge for startup co ops because they don't have a lot of assets typically. Most of them are leasing their space, so they don't have property and land to use for collateral. And their inventory equipment isn't worth a lot to the bank if they should go under. So, um, a lot of the money that goes into these projects is coming from the community in the form of the, the equity people invest or loans that the owners themselves of the co-op make to the co-op rather than coming from an outside bank. And, we, uh, Stuart, we have our last break. It Time goes by real okay. quick when you're having fun. But we'll take the break and we'll come back and we'll give us some testimonies of some examples of these startups. We'll be right back. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOL, at 95.9 FM. WOL, information is power. That's why the WOL makes a great sponsor for us, a great partner in that Chuck Snyder and group and the folks here at Everything Co-op want to give you the information so you can start a co-op or you can go find a co-op to, to buy from or to support you know, if you're given the information, you have to use it. And that's using the information is where you get the power. Information is potential power. Putting action to that information is where you get the power. So, Stuart, let's talk about the power that people get in starting food co-ops. And can you give us some examples of uh, when Keith was on last week, he talked about Renaissance and Jack and Jackson, I think, Mississippi. Be, and he talked mm-hmm. about different places yep. that he's both working on and have already gotten started. Can you give us a couple of examples? Well, there's so many. Uh, the co-ops that uh, have started up and are operating stably, usually successfully after a while, uh, they're bringing so much to their communities. Uh, they've grown. You can even, some of them like Seward Co-op in Minneapolis. When I first started working there, uh, it was next to a biker bar, a laundromat, which was an overnight hangout for people that didn't have a better place. That neighborhood is now one of the, the desirable neighborhoods in Minneapolis, full of commerce, and the co-op is it's built along with the co-op. The co-op anchored a lot of what happened there. 
they've continued to give back to the community in, in many, many ways by supporting local initiatives, providing uh, jobs for people, of course, and, and training for people. It be, it's so much more than a, a grocery store. It's a social hub. It's it's an educational hub. It's, uh, it, it, it's hard to even describe what it means to people sometimes. And social club. I like example, that. It's a social educational club where you buy yeah. some food. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. When I when I go to the co-op, I expect to spend uh, about half of my time there shopping and about half my time talking to people. Uh, <laughs> you don't do that when you go to the supermarket. Um, and I, I enjoy that. I mean, if you're in a hurry, of course, you can get through it. You don't, I'm not telling people here that they have to plan to have twice as much time if they want to shop co-ops. Don't get the wrong message. But you might find you enjoy that. Um, another good example of a co-op that has opened more recently in, in Durham, uh, North Carolina, uh, they're in a mixed neighborhood, very diverse, and they have been able to attract and serve the whole population. Uh, and they've gone very, very strategically planned to have product mix that would appeal to a lot of people, that was affordable to a lot of people. And then they've gone beyond that to bring the community into the store by having innovative programs like a, once a week. They have, uh, I believe it's $4. It's, it's really inexpensive, but they have a complete dinner for $4. Anybody who wants to can come in and get it. It's hold, man, fancy, hold, 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 it's hold. Uh, you can get a dinner for $4? Wait a minute, we're talking 1960 or what? A complete no, dinner I, for $4? That is correct, sir. Good food? And they, good food, good healthy food, solid meals. You know, you're not getting steak and, and uh, you know. I know, steak, is, steak, belief, steak isn't what I eat, but go ahead, good food. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, and, and they are serving hundreds of people. Uh, it's just a, an amazing event. Uh, and other co-ops have started using that idea. It's, it's, again, it's a great example of how co-ops share, share what they learn and, and what works. Well, I mentioned just um, real quickly, the fifth principle is training, education, and information, and that's the perhaps the first reason yeah. I love co-ops is the, the training that, that, that happens within co-ops of passing on best practices with, with cheer and joy and happiness, not sort of hoarding the information. Um, but that, that is what's one of the wonderful things about co-ops. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Keep going. Indeed. Well, those are a couple examples. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to mention a, a less uh, exact. Well, it's not an urban market. Uh, it's a, one of our more unique co-op startups but in Sitka, Alaska, island community where you can't drive there. Everything comes in by plane or by barge. They're running a pre-order food co-op that is doing, uh, I think they're up to about $370,000 worth of food a year that's all shipped in, and they're in a community that has few choices and few options for going anywhere besides a couple of local supermarkets. So they've, they've brought together their own co-op community, created it, and are serving both all of the Sitka citizens, including the native tribes, uh, with High quality food that wasn't either wasn't available or was ridiculously expensive. So, again, it's it's this idea that co-ops can meet the unmet needs of the community uh, in unique ways by pooling our resources. So, co-ops can meet the unmet needs in a community. Yes, sir. I believe that very very strongly. That that's one of our biggest assets that we we offer. Co-ops, because this is one I, uh, that I'm going to use. I like it. Co-ops can meet the unmet needs in a community. That first October, Papa Sin from Senegal said that, uh, this is five years ago now, that co-ops are formed to solve community problems. If there's no community problems, there's no need for a co-op. So I've <laughs> repeated that over and over, but I like this. Co-ops can meet the unmet needs in a community. That's that's short and sweet. I like that. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, and frankly, I, I, I'm not sure that I agree that there's no need for a co-op 
even if the needs are met. I mean, I think there is a good argument that a co-op can do it better uh, than other kinds of businesses. We we are challenged by the economies of scale, uh, by efficiencies, by the huge marketing budgets of multinational corporations, but there's the human element of what we do and the fact that we, we're not working to enrich someone, but just to meet our own needs. Uh, if we can get that message out more effectively, I think there'll be a lot more interest in, in the co-op movement. Not working to enrich someone. That's normally the shareholders, the someone that puts in capital, capital of one percenters or those up there high up. Yeah. They put in their capital and in and they, my MBA the program. They have no interest. They, they may not have ever even used the business. They don't have a, they don't have a, a lot of the investment in, in corporate America is through retirement accounts and savings accounts. People don't even know where their money is. They don't care as long as they're seeing profit on it. Uh, why not invest that money into a local organization in your community where you know it's providing jobs and it's helping to make your community stronger? Uh, and you'll still see benefit from it. Uh, so that's that's the cooperative economy. Well, in my MBA program, which I graduated in 76, that um, every decision was based on return on investment. Now, there may have been some sub, subset kinds of things of what's best for the customer or something, 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 but it was return on investment, return on investment, return on investment, uh, like yeah. getting your money back, getting your money back. It was totally focused on money for those shareholders that invested their monies. Um, and that's that leads to short-term decisions of what can give, and that's not necessarily best for the planet or best for the stakeholders, the employees, or even the customers. Um, exactly. So that's why I like co-ops, too, is focus on people, planet, then profit. you got to have the profits, or you can't. Yeah, you got to have the profit to survive. But I think if you just turn that expression, return on investment, around a little bit, measure the, you have to measure it differently. It's not just dollars. It's the health of your community. It's the happiness of the people in the community. It's you know, all of the things that you can do when bottom line isn't the only consideration. Well, this is, uh, if you hadn't heard, there was a lady from Finland on the program a couple months ago, and I'm hard with names too. She said early on in the in the hour that Finland had won the United Nations World Happiness Report, that Finland came in number one this year. Uh, announced, mm -hmm. uh, I think, January of this year, that Finland are the happiest people in the world. Uh, the U.S. came in 18, Great Britain came in 19. And at the end of the program, she said, but during the program, she said that 25% of the people in Finland are members of co-ops, and sometimes they're members of three co-ops, five co-ops, and numbers of co-ops. And she said at the end of the program that the reason people in Finland are happiest is because of co-ops. I found sure. that very, very interesting. And that's what you said too. Ha you're concerned about happiness of people, their health, uh, wealth, then invest in co-ops. Yes. Got it. Feeling like you've got a little control in your life that you, uh, you're not at the mercy of invisible forces and, in you know, that you can't even identify it. That, that's powerful stuff. Powerful. You have say so in your world, whether that's a, your housing co-op or your food co-op or your credit union, or if it's a worker-owned co-op, you in your job you have a say. And exactly. People listen. Listen. We only have one minute, Stuart. You have a message you want to leave people in forty-five well, seconds. If you, if anybody listening is interested in starting a food co-op in their own community, I encourage you to check out our website. Give us a call. Uh, even if you don't have any questions right away, we love to talk to you and, and help help you find the kinds of resources that will work best. And if anybody wants to support our work, 
you can go to our website again and look for the little green donate button. We'd really appreciate your support. Look at Food Co-op Initiative, F-O-I dot C-O-O-P. Thank you, Stuart. Right. FCI.com. Thank you. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Please live and work this week cooperatively. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOF, and 95.9 FM.